So in the previous video, I sketched this flow net and showed how to get the flow net as a solution to the two-dimensional Laplace equation. What we're going to do in this video is now use the flow net to try to um, compute flow rate, total head throughout the system, um, and so forth. Because that's really the purpose for sketching a flow net in the first place. So if we come down here, okay, now that we know how to draw the flow net, um, what we can do is first get the total head at the various points throughout the uh, flow net. So the, um, the equipotential lines here, you know, these lines that kind of arc down to the bottom surface, are lines of constant total head. Okay, that means that um, all along each of these lines, the total head is the same amount. Um, and the other thing that we'll find is that when you go from, well, remember this surface is an equipotential line because the total head is constant along that line. And then every time you go through a drop from one equipotential line to another, the change in total head is the same. So the, the total, you know, the, the change in head between this line and that line is the same as the total head change from that line to that line, and so forth, all the way through the system. So what we're going to do now is count the number of equipotential lines. We'll call that n sub d, or the number of drops. It's actually the number of equipotential drops, not the number of equipotential lines, right? So in this case, we count them up, one, two, three, all the way through, and we find that we have 10 equipotential drops. So uh, nd is equal to 10 for this flow net. We actually have 11 equipotential lines because that surface is an equipotential line and that surface is an equipotential line. And we have nine lines in between. Um, okay, now what we need to do is compute the head loss per equipotential drop. And that's just the total head loss divided by n sub d. So in this case, delta hi is the head loss per equipotential drop. It's equal to the total head loss through the system, which is two meters, right? We have two meters of water height there and none there. So there's um, two meters of total head drop through this uh, sheet pile as water seeps underneath it. So we get 2 meters divided by 10 drops. We have 0 0.2 meters of head loss per equipotential drop. So uh, what we can do now is come in and label the total head associated with each of these equipotential lines, and it becomes like a contour plot. Right? So this one has 2 meters of total head. Okay, you notice that our datum is right here. Let's just review real quickly how we got 2 meters. The elevation of that surface is 0. The pressure head is 2 meters. Therefore, the elevation head plus the pressure head is 2 meters. Okay, the um, elevation of this line is 0. The pressure is 0. <coughs> Therefore, the total head is also 0. So we have 2 meter total head here, 0 there. And then each one uh, is just 0.2. Uh, it's kind of fortunate. I didn't intend to draw it with 10 equipotential drops, but that's a nice even number, right? So it makes it easy to sketch this. Here we have 1.8, 1.6 meters, 1.8. And I put the labels down here, right beneath the sheet pile. The lines get a little bit tight, so there's 1.2, 1, 1.8, and then we get 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, all the way to zero. Um, all right, now that you know those total head contours, you can interpolate total head at any point by just measuring the distance between these equipotential drops and computing the total head depth by linear interpolation. You also know the elevation at all of those points at any point you want. So now that you can interpolate total head, you can also get pressure head and pore pressure at those points as well. Um, so like for example, let's calculate pore pressure at that point right there, the blue point. It's in between two of these total head drops, so it's at about 0.45 meters just by visual inspection. You zoom in points right there. It's a little hard to see it because the arrow is kind of intruding on it, but you can see the center of the point would be right around there. So I interpolated that just by visual inspection to be about 0.45 meters. Uh, the elevation head is about negative 2, right? It looks like it's about halfway in between the top and the bottom. So the elevation head is negative 2, therefore the pressure head is total head minus elevation head. We get 2.45 meters, which is the pressure head. So then the pore pressure is the pressure head times the unit weight of water. 2.45 times 9.81 is about 24 kPa of pore pressure. All right, now, um, 
notice that that pore pressure is higher than what you would get by simply multiplying the unit weight of water by a depth of two meters. Right? This is not hydrostatic water pressure. So uh, that's why you can't do that anymore. You have to do the total head interpolation to find the pore pressure there. Um, on the side where the water is flowing upward, the pore pressure is going to be higher than what you would get by just multiplying unit weight by depth. On the left side, the pore pressure is going to be lower than what you would get by multiplying the unit weight of water times the depth below that water surface because the water is flowing down. So it's um, the, the direction of total head loss is different. All right, now <clears throat> let's look at computing flow rate. Flow rate is one of the more accurate calculations we can do with a flow net. And remember, when I drew this flow net, I did not make it perfect, right? If you look at the flow net, you can't perfectly fit a circle inside each of these regions. That's an oval. That's definitely an oval. You know, maybe that one's pretty good, but not all of these regions are square. Um, I drew it quickly. I'd probably try and get it better if this was a real project. Although if this was a real project, I wouldn't draw a flow net. I would use a finite element seepage analysis, which I'll show you in another lecture. Um, so there are errors associated with flow nets. Flow rate is actually one of the more accurate things we can get out of a flow net, despite its flaws. So uh, let's look at how we can derive the flow rate. We'll look at that first flow channel. So what I'm talking about by flow channel is just like this region right there where water is flowing this way, right? So that's a flow channel. And then uh, let me zoom in here so you can see how it's labeled. The flow channel has a width A and a height B. And we'll just look at the first cell of the first flow channel right now. And this, this seems like it's setting up to be a lot of work, right? Because there's a whole bunch of cells, and then we have a whole bunch of flow channels. Man, this is going to take forever. It turns out to be pretty easy. And we'll assume that the uh, hydraulic conductivity is constant. Okay, so what we have is the flow through that first cell is equal to hydraulic conductivity multiplied by the hydraulic radiant in the first cell multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the first cell. So the cross-sectional area is, is simply A, lowercase a, multiplied by the out-of-plane thickness dy. Notice that we're in the zx plane and y is the out-of-plane dimension. So what we can do is say that dy is just equal to 1 maybe one meter if we're dealing with meters. And then we know that when we solve flow, it's going to be per unit width into and out of the plane of the problem. So if you have a sheet pile that's really long, there's going to be more water coming through than if you have a sheet pile that's very short in that out of plane direction. So uh, if you had a real problem, you would just multiply by that length to get the flow rate. So we'll solve it per unit width. Okay, so substituting. Q1 is equal to Ki1 times lowercase a1. And then I1 is equal to the change in total head through that element divided by the element height, which is B1. Right? So we already know that there was some change in total head from the top to the bottom, and then the height is B. Right? So um, the change in total head through that first cell was equal to HT divided by ND. Right? That's the head loss per equipotential drop. By B1. So now we have Q1, the flow through element 1, is equal to KHT, which is a total head loss, 2 meters in this case, divided by ND, which is obtained from the flow net, it's 10 in this case, divided by B1, and then multiplied by A1. Alright, now we made the flow net square, right? So we were sure to make it so that you can perfectly fit a circle in each cell. And what that means is that A1 is equal to B1, right? The width has to be equal to the height if that cell is square. So these terms cancel out if you draw the flow net correctly. So the flow through cell 1 is K times HT over ND. Okay, notice that we've gotten rid of all of the variables that had a subscript 1 now. There were some variables that were specific to cell 1. They've now gone away. So we have the flow in cell 1 depending only on hydraulic conductivity, total head loss, and the number of equipotential drops. Now, the flow th through the first element in the flow channel, the first cell, has to be equal to the flow through other elements in the flow channel. Right? The amount of water flowing out of one into the other has to equal the amount of water flowing out of the other, right? because the cells 
are staying the same size. The soil is not growing, it's not consolidating, it's staying the same volume, therefore flow in has to equal flow out. So what we've done is actually solved for the flow rate through cell one, because the flow rate through the first cell of cell one, of, of channel one, is equal to the flow through the whole channel, because the water going in, the first one has to equal the water going out of the last one. All right, so we've got the first flow channel. Now let's look at the second flow channel. Now we have subscripts 2, A2, and B2. So again, we go through this process, Q2 is equal to K, I2, A2. We'll substitute big A2, and it just becomes lower A2, DY, but DY is equal to 1. I2 is equal to delta H2 over B2, and delta H2 is equal to HT over ND, just like it was for the first flow channel, right? The equipotential drop. Um, for the second flow channel is equal to the equipotential drop for the first cell, um, for the first channel. Okay, so then we go here, Q2 is equal to KHT over ND divided by B2 times A2, but of course A2 is equal to B2 because we drew the flow net to be square. Therefore, Q2 is equal to KHT over ND. So we've done channel one, we've done channel two, they're exactly the same, right? Q1 is equal to Q2, so that's the flow through each channel. So if we draw the flow net to be square, each channel carries the same amount of flow. So that's really convenient, right? I even put an exclamation point here. The flow through each channel is the same. So if we want to compute the total flow, all we have to do is multiply by the number of flow channels in F. Okay, so. Um, Let's look at the number of flow channels that we have for this flow net. Here's one, there's the second one, and then here's the third one. So we only have three flow channels in this case. Maybe it's easiest to look down here. If you want to compute them, you can clearly see that there's only three right there. It gets to be a little bit confusing because uh, this domain continues on infinitely in both directions, and you know there's no circle fit over there perfectly, but anyway, you can clearly see the number of flow channels right beneath the bottom of the sheet pile. So, um, let's see. Ah, okay, right here. So, we have Q, the total flow beneath the sheet pile, is hydraulic conductivity times total head loss times NF over ND. And NF over ND is the shape factor for the flow net. And it depends only on geometry. So once you've sketched a flow net, you have all the flow lines, you have the potential lines, you, you have this NF over ND shape factor solved. And the total flow only depends on the head loss and permeability and that shape factor. A little bit counterintuitive, but pretty powerful thing. So let's do the calculation of flow rate for this example problem. We have NF equals 3, HT equals 2 meters, K is equal to 10 to the minus 5 centimeters per second, and ND is equal to 10. So um, what I'm going to do first is compute K in meters per second, so it's 10 to the minus 7 meters per second, times 2 meters, right? We can't have this in centimeters per second and then use meters there. We've got to make them the same. And then times 3 over 10, 3 flow channels over 10, equal potential drops. And we get the flow rate is 6 times 10 to the minus 8 cubic meters per second per meter of out-of-plane dimension. Now, you could represent this as meters squared per second, but uh, that would be counterintuitive, right? What we really have is cubic meters per second, which is an actual flow rate, divided by meters, which is the out-of-plane width. So if we had, say, 10 meters of sheet pile, we would multiply by 10 and get rid of that meters, and we would have 6 times 10 to the minus 7 cubic meters per second of water flowing in. And that would, if you had to design a pump, that would be the number you would have to design for to uh, pump out. All right, now let's look at the uh, exit gradient. This one is a little bit more challenging to get from a flow net. It's much more sensitive to the details of the flow net and how accurately you've uh, designed your, or drawn your, your, your net. So generally, exit gradient, we're gonna be worried about this element right there. Okay, if uh, that, that's the one where there's a, a head loss over the shortest length, and it's gonna have the biggest upward gradient. Right. If you look at the second cell, it's the same head loss, but it's happening over more length. This first one, big, bigger head loss over shorter length, so the exit gradient is going to be bigger. 
So we'll compute I at that point as being delta H over B. And now you actually have to measure B. It looks like it's about 0.8 meters to me. I mean, I'm just reading it off of the graph here, but that looks about right. Um, you would want to actually draw this perfectly to scale and maybe go measure it with a ruler if you're doing this graphical solution. So the vertical exit gradient there is 0.25, right? It's 0.2 meters, which is the head loss, divided by 0.8 meters, which is the cell height. Um, if gamma saturated is 20 kilometers per meter cubed, then the critical hydraulic gradient would be 1. Remember, the critical hydraulic gradient is the buoyant unit weight uh, divided by the unit weight of water. So um, for this sheet pile, we won't have a quicksand condition forming. Right, the critical, the factor of safety against quicksand would be equal to the critical hydraulic gradient. That's like the amount that you would have to have to create quicksand divided by the actual hydraulic gradient, which is what you've got for this particular problem. So it's one divided by 0.25. The factor of safety is four. So we're not even that close to forming quicksand for for this particular.